think how you are connected to nature. Um, how get how do you get your your um, food? What are you eating? Are you eating beef? Are you eating uh, meat? Um, what kind? How often? Because that is all related to rainforest. We all know about that. Um, it's related to how we grow uh, food. And I think it is not waiting for politicians to change um, the rules. It is about us being aware that we should help to change the rules. And that is part of um, how often we use uh, planes in the future, uh, what we eat, where we go, uh, how we treat nature in our gardens, uh, how we um, eliminate nature for another area where we want to build housing or a autobahn or whatever is built. And we should be much more conscious. And I'm not saying we should, and we will be able to avoid everything. I'm not saying here in, in an ascetic um, mission and um, that we should go back to nature. No way. Um, it is about uh, being more conscious about that. <laughs> Professor Dr. Matthias Glaubrecht is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media and Innovators Magazine. The end of evolution, man and the destruction of species. The evolutionary biologist Matthias Glaubrecht sees the greatest loss of species since dinosaurs became extinct as a worldwide biological tragedy. The greatest threat to the existence of all living beings is definitely humans whose own future is at stake. This is his wonderful book in German, uh, Das Ende der Re Evolution, and it is a wonderful, beautiful read by the Bertel Bertelsmann, C. Bertelsmann uh, Publishing and Verlag. It was the short list of 2021 for the medicine biology category for the best science book of the year. Only 20 books made it into this campaign and to this category by the Federal Ministry for Education, Science and Research together with the magazine Book Culture and the Austrian book industry. Matthias has a long, uh, career and history, and in October 2014, he was the director of the Center for Natural History at the University of Hamburg, April 2006 to March 2009, head of research de department at the Museum of Natural History, Berlin. In 2002, Academic Superior Council, he has numerous experiences with museums, science, and zoology. He was a guest scientist for the Zoological Institute and Zoological Museum, University Hamburg. Uh, he's working on all sorts of new fabulous museum projects currently, and I'm hoping to get into that during our podcast. I really could go on just an hour on all his accreditations, his career, his studies, his books, his publications. Um, but I want to touch on a few important ones like the Zoological Institute and Zoological Mu Museum, uh, where he received the University Hamburg Journalism Awards in 2006, uh, a media prize from Humboldt University Society. Um, also in 1996, the Werner and Inga Gruter Prize for Science of Journalism for a foundation of German science, in particular for the nonfiction book, Der Lange Atem der Schöpfung, so the long breath of the, the long breath of uh, evolution, what Darwin would have liked to know. As I mentioned, I hope we can really get into a lot of these other accreditations and accolades that he's received over the years. He's studied all around the world and, and been involved in many, many things. Professor Dr. Matthias Glaubrecht, welcome to the show. It's so good to have you. I, I hope I can call you Matthias, if that's okay. That's absolutely fine. Hi, Mark. 
It's so good to have you here. And we we uh, want to let my listeners know that we've had a podcast before, or a, a different presentation before, where it was mainly in German, where you gave us a, a, a slide introduction of your book and kind of went into some particulars. And at the end of that presentation, I basically chewed your ear off. I think I was the only one left for about an hour long worth of questions that I had because I've read your book uh, and it is such a wonderful work. There's no doubt in my mind why it was nominated for out of the top 20 scientific books um, for this category and this prize because it is a fabulous read. Now, I think when when I first was telling you uh, about the book and and that I you know I, I might have scared you and 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 even my listeners I kind of say you know boy this is such a big read and just the sheer size of it can be overwhelming but I want to dispel that myth right off the bat because it is a fabulous wonderful read it's it's uh, comparable to Yuval Noah Harari's is comparable to Steven Pinker, uh, uh, Jared Diamond, to some really wonderful um, fiction books that, that are giving big history, giving out science and data. That's an academic type of a book, but it doesn't read like an academic type of book. So you're definitely not going to fall asleep uh, if you can make it past the overwhelming size and breadth of it. But I want, I want our listeners to know that it's that way for a purpose because uh, uh, we've really been here on this planet um, uh, compared to the other species in our, in our, in our world and, and the birth of our planet for a short period of time. But um, there, is, there is a big history. There is a big story to be told. And so I, I really thank you for that. And, and I want to jump right into it with the first question for you uh, going into the book, because you've been doing this for so many years and in and, and academics, you've, you've learned, you've studied this, you've written about it, you've worked with the mu museums, you're uh, an evolutionary uh, biologist and, and uh, really have all that knowledge. Has this crazy time of our pandemic, has any of that experience, those things helped you to weather this time better to say, oh, I could see it coming. We've talked about it kind of coming or, or uh, how have you been? How have you been during this crazy time? Yeah, yeah well, um, it, it, is, it still is a crazy time and uh, it's not a time to you know, raise your finger and say, see, I've, I've told you. But um, of course, this is a, a pandemic with announcement. I mean, scientists have warned for at least the last two decades um, that uh, something like that um, might happen and uh, that a um, epidemic and a pandemic will actually develop out of the um, tropical or subtropical areas in Asia or in Africa. So um, it's not a surprise, but it came as a surprise to, of course, most of us. Um, but we could have known because um, the pandemic that we see now um, has, you know, um, predecessors, you know, um, there were SARS uh, in 2002 and 2004 in, in Asia, but of course, in Europe and North America, people thought, okay, well, that is related only to Asia, it had nothing to do with us. And uh, we have been warned by Ebola and um, HIV, um, but um, people in, in Europe felt safe. And I think we all felt safe for a long time because um, we thought for last hundred years that we have virtually eradicated most um, you know, diseases and um, things that um, other generations have suffered from. So um, we, we felt fairly sure, and this, of course, is um, a misguided uh, assumption. And uh, um, what we see now is directly related to our um, treatment of nature, how we, um, you know, um, how we, we have developed over the last, um, let's say, 50 years into a major evolutionary factor. Um, this is, um, you know, of course, it is mirrored 
uh, in terms like the Anthropocene um, officially announced or scheduled to start by um, 1950 over the second half of the 20th century. So the pandemic is only another sign of um, what we are doing since half a century to this planet. And of course, human beings have a influence that goes back even further, but uh, we have this phenomenon of a great acceleration of all these signatures from carbon dioxide to um, deforestation. And of course, and that is my major subject, people have overlooked what we do in terms of deforestation. It's not only that we get rid of, um, of um, forest, but half uh, of the uh, earth cover uh, originally covered by forests are long gone. Um, and uh, we are also destroying um, not only plants, but um, we are destroying the biological richness, um, the, the treasure trove of this planet, which is the, our biological um, heritage. And, and of course, all that is related to what we see now, um, diseases jumping from animals to man because we are moving around the earth, we're destroying their natural habitats, we're getting in closer contact. And we are, of course, not um, out of this uh, um, scenario, you know, we are part of nature, we forget about that all the time, we make this distinction about culture and nature and human beings and, you know, the other 99%. Um, and this is all um, not really um, existent, you know, and we should be aware that we are part of nature. And um, so, um, yeah, um, as I said, it's it's related. And uh, nevertheless, of course, we're, we're suffering uh, all here, economy is suffering. But the light uh, at the end of the tunnel is maybe that the year before the pandemic, we are especially here in Germany, had a discussion on, um, you know, how we can change and is it, is it possible that society will change and we need more time for slowly changes. And suddenly we have all these abrupt um, adaption and adaptations to a new situation. I think this is a very hopeful sign that if danger is big enough and the awareness of the um, that the danger, then human beings on a global scale are able to react, um, if you like it or not. Yeah, I have a few questions that kind of delve more into that. So I, I, I understand the uh, precipice of the entire thing that you just described, but I almost want to get in a little bit more and I want to get a little bit personal. Um, because you've been in this area, because you've written this, because you, this exhaustive work, that you've written, um, is that more or less to raise awareness and politics and government and humanity to, to emphasize a change um, um, and also kind of to a pinnacle of all your uh, comp compilation of uh, a pinnacle of all your works over the years? Um, but, that, but does that also give you a little bit for your family, I know you have a, young, I believe, a young daughter and a, fa a beautiful family. Two that boys, yeah. two boys, okay, and, and that you um, create some form of saying, oh, I've been studying, I've been researching, I've been writing about this. I work in the museums. I can see some patterns. Do, am I waiting for others to kind of prepare? Is there any kind of resilience or things with that knowledge that you can apply to your own lives that? That in times like this, that 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 we weather better, or is it is is nobody immune? Is it something that yeah. that that doesn't exist? Well, it is. This this book uh, is dedicated to, as we say in in Germany, uh, as a, as a joke, we uh, I'll call them the two Erdlinge, You know, the the two Earthlings. The two know? Earthlings, uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, and uh, of course it is a personal sign. The, the book was triggered not only by the you know, all these accumulation of facts and scientific um, data that um, you can accumulate and that is accumulated in this book. And it is by far not comprehensive, uh, comprehensive even if it is, um, you know, a total of about a thousand pages. But uh, we have seen last year the report by the um, World Biodiversity Panel, you know, the IBBES, 
this intergovernmental panel for biodiversity and ecosystem services. And in their report published, uh, first published in May 2019, um, they have reported on the analysis of about 15,000 studies, you know. So there's a lot of evidence um, out there. And of course, uh, uh, as, a, um, as only one person, it was only possible to make a selection of papers and facts and, and data to develop a, a story. Um, but it was definitely triggered, although I was accumulating those studies, it was triggered by the simple thought when my um, eldest son was born a couple of years ago, and that I thought, um, how would uh, how will the earth and nature look like um, when he is as old as I was when he was born? And um, so a couple of months and years later, I was reading, you know, these, um, these children books to them, you know, and, and just, you know, take um, whatever you, you like, and you hear about all these um, fantastic animals they first um, get to know from those books you no know, elephants like hati and uh, leopards and whatever you take you know and um, if you at the same time during the day study those papers saying that we are losing the larger animals about to uh, up to the size of 10 kilograms over the next couple of years or decades then you uh, suddenly recognize that you're reading um, about animals to them um, that um, will not exist when they do this to their children, you know? And um, by that time, there were more tigers, for example, in zoos and um, in, in circus um, than in nature, you know? We have, we're, we're down to about 4,000 tigers in total um in asia um isolated in fragments of their original distributional range um and um we know that there were about uh, as uh, their estimates that around 1900 19 uh, the nine, uh, be beginning of the 20th century um there were about 100,000 tigers and now we are down to 4000 and you, if you look at taxidermy uh, firms in, in India, you uh, and look into their um, accounts and books, you see that, you know, they have, there's one in Misol in India um, that processed 50,000 um, skins and heads just to nail them to the wall, you know, or put them in front of your, your bed. So um, we have a um, you know, very destructive um, effect. And this is only one of so many, a plethora of, of, um, of uh, examples, how we treat nature. And we are, you know, day by, year by year, we are taking about 80 million tons of fish out of um, the oceans, you know. And we have done this over the last couple of years and decades. And uh, of course, um, this is not an endless planet, and I think we have recognized and we have to um, accept that there is not a uh, endless um, development of, of that. And um, what I became interested in is not so much of just stating the obvious and, and accumulating the fact, of course, that is part of the book. Um, and I was definitely sure that at the end of the book, I wanted to give a um, scenario, you know, what is more likely. And when writing uh, this part, I, I recognize that I can't decide what's, what's more likely, you know, that we make it through this crisis or that we actually um, will um, suffer on our own uh, uh, from this crisis. But in the first part of the book, um, I wanted to develop the idea why we are so successful as human beings, as homo sapiens, and uh, so I sketched out a bit what we know about where we came from. It's a long journey that uh, hominids um, uh, look back to. Um, they came a long way, but Homo sapiens is only 300,000 years old. This is the most recent evidence we have from Morocco, from Northwest Africa, um, that um, that's where, where it started, you know. Um, and then it's interesting to look how fast we have 
colonized um, this planet and wherever we occur during the colonization and the, and the exodus from, from Africa, which was the second, you know, two million years ago, Homo erectus made it into other parts uh, except uh, Africa, but um, he hasn't destroyed the entire environment, you know, he was not harmless, of course, he was also hunting, um, he might have had fire, uh, he was definitely changing the environment, um, but it was nothing compared to what happened when Homo sapiens colonized the earth. And we can recognize first in Australia, then in North America and South America, that within thousands of years, you know, um, we really talk about thousands of years here, that um, the, um, the entire earth was colonized and whenever Homo sapiens appeared um, the megafauna, the first um, big human, uh, the first big uh, faunal uh, elements were disappearing. And, and people don't believe that, for, or they haven't um, believed for a long time that that is related. You know, they had all these arguments about is it really Blitzkrieg and something like that. And um, more and more evidence is, is actually um, pointing to us as the decisive factor um, being responsible for the overkill and the destruction of this uh, formal elements. And so human beings have this pioneering um, frontier mentality. It's not only that you can see this in, during the colonization of Europeans in North America, you can not only see that um, in the colonial times when Europeans entered in other parts during the globalization, you can not only see that um, after 1492, uh, after um, the uh, so-called um, time of, of, of the first globalization by the era of discoveries, you know, it's a very typical behavior that we move on, that we move into um, uh, virgin areas, you know, um, deployed the resources and then try to move uh, out and, and, and move further. So this migrational um, impetus we have is, is related to our pioneering mentality. So we are not born as, you know, treating our nature um, sustainable. And uh, so this is our biological heritage. But what is actually, um, what about our cultural heritage? And I think that's what we see in the pandemic time. You know, we, we see that we are able to react in very short time we are able to communicate to the rest of the world what's going on. Uh, we learn that we have to adapt. It, it is still a process that is awfully um, um, slow to my taste. Of course, we need to convince so many people that they have to change their behavior. We have to start with ourselves to, to um, change our own behavior or, and we have to get rid of, of you know, very um, much like habits that we are used to, but it's possible. So we are able to overcome parts of our biological heritage using one of these instruments that Homo sapiens have, our brains. And I think there is hope that something that I call the um, uh, the cumulative cultural evolution that that is something that will eventually help us. Um, once we have realized that we are part a biological, um, you know, animal and, and part of a cultural animal, and that we have to reconcile these two um, developments or the, these two sides of our souls and uh, of our nature. So is this, uh, I want to touch on a couple of things. So this cultivated uh, evolution, uh, cultural evolution that, that you mentioned. Um, because I speak a lot about as, as well as a kind of a cognitive intelligence or a collective intelligence that we have that uh, dis distinguishes us from a lot of other species where we can leave behind books and recordings and videos and pass on to our posterity in a much shorter amount of time than natural evolutionary processes. Explain a little bit more what you mean by uh, the cognitive cult cultural evolution. And then I, I want to actually jump a little bit back to what you mentioned before about 
uh, our impact on species and what we're kind of seeing today and, and maybe Steve pull some more out, but I'll let you answer that first. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, I think this is an important aspect. Um, many people are not used and not educated and, and not doing research as evolutionary biologists. And I think this is the majority um, that um, there, there is a difficulty of really thinking in, in evolutionary time frame. And uh, of course, most people remember their parents and their grandparents, but that goes back um, like two generations, maybe three generations. And that is covering, um, if, it, if, if you're lucky, it's covering a century, you know? And most of the people working in humanities and in other areas not related to evolutionary biology think in terms of a hundred years, a thousand years in historical times when we have historical evidence, maybe going back 2000 years, okay? This is of course nothing. And it, um, it needs to have, you need to put that into perspective and realize um, where evolution works, what are the time frame for evolutionary change. And um, see, one of the things that I um, always hear when I give lectures about the um, deformation and the destruction of nature and the that um, we kill species and they, you know, will go extinct. And, and some people say, well, tough, they're not adapted, you know, and there will be new species coming. And uh, I'm working on speciation effects, you know, I, I try to learn how new species arise, what are the processes. And I can tell you, we're talking about um, not centuries and not thousand years. We're not talking about only, you know, tens of thousand years and not hundreds of thousand years. We, we talk about millions of years. And uh, if you look at a species like Homo erectus, you know, um, it might be that um, Homo erectus has, you know, a very long history going back, not only more than 2,000 years, uh, 2 million years, but maybe he existed about 1.5 million years before he went extinct or, or vanished. Um, and, and maybe Homo sapiens is not uh, innocent in this context, you know? So we talk about a long history in evolutionary terms. Now, the speciality of Homo sapiens is that, of course, we do have a cultural evolution too. And maybe the most uh, important cultural transition or behavioral transition for Homo sapiens um, has been domestication, uh, you know, and, and um, the invention of uh, agriculture, everything that has been, uh, you know, um, put or summarized in this, maybe not really very proper term of a Neolithic um, revolution, like 12,000 years ago. We yeah. have learned to live together. We have learned to, to um, you know, um, to, uh, we have domesticated uh, animals for our purposes. We have, you know, um, first sign of agriculture and um, that has changed our, also our relationship to uh, within uh, human beings, you know, with, with, with others. We're living closer, we are more, we're getting more and more since then. Um, so, but, but it was not only a new paradise, you know, we have also at that time, the start of a much more aggressive behavior in human beings, um, a much more destructive behavior. But we have learned over hundreds and thousands of years um, to live together and to adapt. Uh, we have also, you know, invited a lot of viruses and, and everything. All these um, children, uh, child diseases that we have, you know, are related to viruses that came from bovids, you know, from, from the cows that we are living with and, and others. So that has also uh, had a destructive influence, but we have in, a, in an evolutionary way adapted to that and also in a cultural way we have adapted. And um, one of the cultural signs is, for example, the Bible, the Old Testament, when you read about all these destructive forces and, and all these, you know, murder, murder and, and everything. And, and then you have these, how do you call that? The, the ten, um, ten uh, commandments, the, the ten commandments. Well, yeah. And, yeah. and, and 
this is something where, where we think, and it's, it's, that is actually from a very important book written by a Dutch anthropologist, Karel van Schaik. Um, and and uh, right there, I'm holding it up. So that's a it's a great Carl von Scheich is someone you referred to me, and hopefully we'll have him on the podcast. But it's a this is one of his books is a fabulous read. Yeah, well, I, I was impressed when I when I read this uh, the first time. You know, I, I thought because it has a very um, a, a strange title in German. It's it's called the Diary of Creation. You know, and I thought, okay, well, this is another creational. A book, and as an evolutionary biologist, I'm I'm not really tempted to read something like that. But you know, don't don't um, um, mis mistake or, or you you should not um, you should be very clear about this book. He's explaining, or the two authors, and other is a, a historian um, uh, Kai Michel, and and they're explaining how important this behavioral transition. Um, after domestication and invention of agriculture was and that the Bible um, is telling about that process and they're, um, you know, developing this term of the cumulative cultural evolution. And uh, I think we have seen something like that over the last decades and centuries too, you know. Um, see how much we have changed our behavior towards um, other parts uh, of, of humankind, you know. Today, um, we think um, uh, colonialism and slavery is something that is not a very proper um, behavior in human beings, okay? We are sanctioning that and, um, and, and uh, we have a very clear opinion about the destructive and, and non-human behavior of that, but for centuries that was basically a very typical behavior you know you can see that since there's war uh, there, there are slaves and um, that has uh, continued over at least a couple of of centuries you know thousands of years so well, those are the cultures that you're talking about that are emerging over time yeah and, and i mean if you look at countries in europe like like switzerland you know i mean you, you won't believe but it's only a couple of decades ago that they allow uh, women to vote okay so things like that um, um of course are overdue uh, to to be changed but we are able to, to um, change into a more democratic um, attitude and behavior and, and things like that. So there is a cultural signature here and we are able to change our behavior on a global scale um, within, uh, let's say, decades or centuries. It's, it's slow. It's definitely too slow. We can't wait for decades or even centuries to adapt to the situation we have now. But during the pandemic, you can see how fast we are able to react. So this is actually giving um, me a lot of hope that um, there is something like cumulative cultural evolution in human beings acting. Um, so Homo sapiens has a chance and, and it, it, the chance is by, by all the media um, that you can think of, you know, this includes um, talking, this includes book, and of course, all the new technology that we have, um, which we are just right now using um, to actually educate and to talk to other people, to convince them that we need to change our um, behavior. So it's not only long-term evolution, it's short-term cultural evolution that um, we are able to follow and to adapt. And that is my hope. And one of the important things is that we need to transport messages and there need to be more than, you know, an, an, a little tweet, you know, that might not be enough. That might be enough for former American presidents, but that yeah. is a good instrument to really transport more complicated and complex uh, things. I'm not sure, I'm not convinced that this thousand page book is, is another good instrument, but it is, you know, it is a sign of, um, we're trying to, um, to distribute um, these um, evidences, facts and, and data to a, to a wider audience. And, and you, of course, are helping a lot, you know. 
Well, I definitely think that it, that uh, it is it is a good way if you can you know you have to pick everybody up where they're at, and some people um, are just not readers, and and so 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 just by the sheer vision of that, then they would be scared off. Um, yeah. and, and you had asked me 20 years ago, I probably would have fainted if I saw a book that big, you know, and, um, and, and wouldn't, wouldn't have gone near. But having read it and know how wonderfully it's written and, and it takes you on this nice journey, it's more in a, in a, in a different way. It's not, a, not true form academic in, in the way that it reads, which I really like. And, and uh, so I, I definitely think that there's different ways that we pick up and get this information to everyone. Uh, there's a couple of things that you're, you're telling me that's coming out of this. One, it, it's definitely not an exhaustive, the complete uh, uh, picture of evolution, but what it is, it's a very complex, complexity science uh, systems of systems that you've taken a good many facets uh, of a... Um, of a system and put them together in this book and you present this, not just a big history, but a big picture of kind of, that gives us many different components of this. This Once we've read the book, uh, that we can see a much bigger picture of understanding and that if we go by, and what you just mentioned, if we go by just natural evolution that we're, we're to, we could talk millions of years, hundreds of thousands of years, Whereas if we, cultural evolution, uh, collective uh, cultivated cultural evolution would be something that'd be a little bit faster than millions of years, but it was also a longer process. And, but I'm also hearing out there could be some possibilities in that as well, where uh, culture can shift and change a little bit faster, where if we, we unify in a critical mass that maybe we could shift our culture to, to, to better wisdoms, to better ways of doing things that would do that. There was something before that I really wanted to touch upon. Um, you, you were talking about the species and how um, the, the big, big uh, not just big game, but the bigger animals were you know, being used as carpets and, and hung on the walls and, and that. And, and during this time, uh, uh, of the pandemic as well, there was a, a lot of things on, on TV series about in Florida, these big tiger and, and, and things where there's more of these animals in zoos and captivity and, and different type of sideshows that, you know, some crazy things going on. But also um, TikTok became a real big phenomenon during this time and I'm not into that at all, but there, there's some data that's all already emerging out of that that um, seven out of 10 TikTok videos uh, showing uh, animals are exotic species, you know, uh, monkeys and uh, snakes and lizards and uh, lemurs and whatever else, you know, some pretty exotic uh, 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 animals. And, and I, I guarantee you, not everybody has the right license, the handlers, the uh, I don't know what they call it, I guess, like a restorative type of you know, rehabilitation type of a permit to, to help an animal that's been injured or that, that, that we've encroached upon their area. Now we've got to help them to get back on their feet. Um, and, and we've just kind of had this disconnect, not only with our earth, but with the species around us to kind of figure out how, you know, maybe we could do a cultural shift to to, to live uh, there. And so I, I wanted to kind of mention that, that, you know, it's not just what you're writing about. It's not just the, these reports that are come out We're we're actually seeing it on television and social media and everywhere. It's, it's, it's craziness. It's not, it's not the, a different type of evolution. And, um, but your book is very, it gives us big history, this big, um, this view and it really starts out and also ends with something that I use as well as a climate speaker in some of my presentations and talks um, is the earth rise and the pale blue dot. And you know, there, there's one book it's called the overview effect from Frank White is uh, I think Frank White. And it, it's basically, you know, uh, same things that you discussed in, in your book, how we got those pictures 
what what poses you to start out like that with the Earthwise and with the pale blue dot? Is that part of this bigger history and this connection, or why why did you choose to to begin and end that way? Well, um, Earthwise, you know, this is this picture that was taken by the um, U.S. Uh, um, William uh, Enders during the Apollo 8 mission. Uh, it, it is actually showing uh, in, in, I think it was taken 780 kilometers uh, above the surface of the moon. And uh, suddenly there is this blue um, planet, you know, rising over the horizon of, of the moon. And um, it was not only a fascinating uh, um, photo, but it, it became iconic uh, in not only for the, um, you know, this uh, movement of of um, nature conservation in the in the early 1970s. Um, I think it shows the isolation of Earth in. Um, in, in um, you know, the universe. And uh, there's one thing that, you know, irritates me a lot. And I, I'm a big fan of, you know, space shuttle and, and all these endeavors of human beings, which it is part of this pioneering frontier mentality that we have inherited from our biological ancestors. You know, we are moving out of our normal space, but there is nothing out there again. You know, it's not heritable it's nothing um, where we can it's, it's nowhere where we can go there nevertheless we try this and I, what irritates me a lot is that we are spending billions of dollars like Elon Musk is doing you know to go to um, moon and, and Mars and um, you know there is nothing that we can find you know we will not be able to live there it's not a solution to our problems that we have as human beings as humankind on earth um, so there is this illusion, you know, first, um, destruction of the natural habitats is not that bad, you know, it will recover and new species will arise, you know, and they were, you know, tough, they were like dinosaurs, bad adapted, you know, this is all wrong, this is a, this is a completely um, wrong perspective on nature. And I think Earthrise, you know, puts Earth into perspective in a way of not only looking from outside, which always helps a lot, um, it's, it's showing Earth in this isolated um, cosmos, um, which is really not heritable to human beings. So we have this you know, covered by this tiny um, atmosphere, uh, we have this planet, which is, a, and this is another paradox, um, it is not, this, it has not been discovered, you know, we only know a fraction. You have to realize that it took us 250 years of uh, botanical and zoological system, uh, systematics to describe about 2 million species on Earth. You know, but we have to expect that there are maybe eight or nine million species. So the vast majority is still not um, described in scientific terms. Um, it's not known, but we are just we are destroying, you know, more than um, three quarter of the Earth's um, surface by our, you know, developmental um, developing cities of our um, ways of transport, you know, and for our uh, agriculture. So we are dominating Earth, um, but we haven't really, um, you know, found uh, each and every um, species on Earth. And we can't and we should not spend billions to go somewhere else. We, we should spend them to make this a much more um, um, habitable um, uh, planet. And um, so it fascinated me uh, because this picture Earthrise became a I, I, iconic and, and uh, at the same time, of course, we need this development of conservation in the 1970s. But if you see how much at the same time we have destroyed nature, um, it was not to that we have this movement and it has a, um, it has um, um, brought us into this position that we have protected nature. Um, the contrary is, is actually the case, you know. 
Um, although we have all these people trying to save species and rescue the last of them and, and um, you know, help nature, um, we have developed much more destructive forces than ever before. So this is quite a, a paradoxon that, that while we have the awareness or while the awareness was rising um, that um, we couldn't help destroying more and more nature. And um, so in the first part of the book, I'm, I'm trying to develop on this, you know, time scale, uh, this evolutionary perspective and this cultural perspective. And I was, and I'm trying to develop that starting with this um, remote vision or this remote perspective from outside. Um, Earth and and um, if you look if you today um, look at satellite um, um, images or this satellite videos while satellites you know um, move over the surface of the Earth you see especially at night how much our surface is illuminated artificially illuminated by all our lights, by the traffic lights, by the lights uh, of our cities and mega cities all over the world. And you see how, um, how huge the influence everywhere on the surface of Earth of human beings are. There's, there's, hard, there is virtually no way to go for um, big animals, for other animals. So um, I think this outside perspective helps a lot. And in the second part of the book, I'm, I'm talking about our misperception um, of um, our own um, population. You know, we had all these awful discussions, uh, which, are, which were destructive, of course, starting this not only Robert uh, Malthus in the 19th century, you know, a contemporary of Charles Darwin, um, telling us that we should not help uh, the poor and, and those people starving because, you know, they will um, reproduce and it, it won't make things better. Um, of course, this is an awful and non-human attitude, but um, we should talk about our ex exponential development of our um, world population. And you know that from climate um, perspectives, there's a perspective and prognosis um, of um, the, the of humankind and the human population, and we are we are right now we are talking about nearly eight billion uh, people uh, living on Earth, and in the next two or three decades, we will raise uh, this this figure will rise to about ten or uh, eleven billion um, people and we all we, we have to feed them you know they all want to live we all want to live and we all want to have a you know water and enough food and everything so this of course will cause problems and pointing in to all these uh, cassandra um, voices in the past uh, calling in vain is not really helpful because we have to face the, the fact that Although the rate um, per female, you know, per mother uh, is is uh, decreasing, of course, you know, there are less children born per female, uh, not only in Europe but also in in Asia, in Africa. We are still on a big super tanker, uh, and if you try to move a big super tanker, the first three or four sea miles, you, you will not recognize any movement, you know, and this is the same, although population, um, at the, although the rate per female will drop, um, the um, entire population of homo sapiens will increase incredibly, you know, exponentially, uh, still, and it doesn't help us that um, this curve, you know, may flatten by the end of this century. We have to come to the end of the century without destroying more nature. So the first part of my book is about human uh, biological and cultural nature. The second part is on the development of world population. And then of course, the third part is that um, this will influence the deformational process that we are in the middle of another mass extinction that people haven't recognized. 
and uh, you know we are we are we are turning our faces from these uh, facts we still do we think climate change is our big problem of the 21st century and definitely it is but it is a bit like you know this multiple um, um, organ disease if you go to an to a doctor you know who is a heart specialist he will only look for your heart but if you go to someone you know interested in your kidney he might say you do have a kidney or a liver problem or whatever and earth had both you know climate and loss of animals um, deformation um, the destruction and the shrinking of populations of biodiversity loss is a big you know the big last wave so to say yeah and it and, and you can't help it you know even if you do everything right in terms of uh, you know um, getting a control over um, the overwhelming increase of, of surface temperature and the ocean and the atmospheric temperature. Even if you, if we, we learn within the next years and, and decades to handle this problem in a proper way so that we avoid more than 1.5 or 2 degree zero um, temperature rise, even if we, we, we are successful in, in climate um, um, in, in terms of um, climate change, we will still have this biodiversity loss because it's not related, you know, biodiversity loss is um, essentially and overwhelmingly related to our use of nature and to loss of um, and the fragmentation of habitats, destruction of forests and, and all that and the increase of agriculture. It's not related primarily to climate change. So we do have multiple organ problems here, so to say, and we have to address all of them. But right now we are addressing only climate change in terms of these. We, we tend to get in this siloed or linear approach at solving our global grand challenges. We kind of have the blinders on. We can only see one thing, but it's not only is it complexity science, but it's really this systems thinking out that we can see the world as you know one uh, uh, again as Carl Sagan said it you know there's this uh, uh, emerging uh, consciousness this emerging view of the world as one organism and an organism divided amongst the self is doomed and uh, that that you know brings me back to you know the the what I asked about you know how you start with the earth rising you in. As I read it, I just want to tell you what my, I, 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 I take it, I, not only do I have this sustainability lens on it when I read things, but I have this bigger history. I try to put it in how, how can I apply it to human beings, homo sapiens, to myself? How, how, what, what are you trying to tell me? And I, I want to tell you what I read out and, and you, you mentioned it, you explained it, but I want to kind of go a little bit, almost a little bit deeper. So uh, when, when I show or when you showed or when you discussed the, the, the earth rise, um, I, I show it quite a bit as well. As I mentioned, what I see is, is not the, the nation's borders and the divisions or the, the fragility of our planet uh, that it's our only home, we're all on spaceship earth. I see it for two things. One, I, I see it that I, I want others to understand that we are connected about this. We weren't dropped off from other, some other planet, that this is our home, we're, we're integrally connected to that. And that goes back to what Carl Sagan said as well. Um, we, we are all made of star stuff, basically. You know, The elements of our earth are the elements of the human body. And just like our body, and, and this is what you were saying about uh, the kidneys and the heart, our body has 11 systems. All of them operate independently, but they operate uh, or, or they, they operate as a system together, but not one of those systems, your nervous system, your digestive system, your skeletal system controls the other 10 systems. They all work gooey or in harmony with each other. But if you break a bone, the other 10 systems try to compensate to yep. bring you back from that disability. And that's the system, this collective way of looking not only at our planet, uh, at ourselves and these systems. And so the first thing when I see that image and, and there's so much story around that, 
and hear, hear that I want to connect myself and humanity to our planet Earth, that we are crawled out of the primordial soup of this planet and we, we uh, as homo sapiens, and we're so lucky to be here. But secondly, and you touched upon this with Elon Musk and you know the others who are going to Mars and space, um, is that the only reason we have that image is through sheer innovation. And you talked about afterwards, uh, the satellites that, that um, uh, are part of, you know, uh, of the data we collect. Because we went to space, we discovered Earth, and we uh, are, if we're going to be out there, which I don't think does us very much good, there is some data that can give us some, some accurate information about what's going on here on this big planet. Because we don't un understand complexity science, we tend to get hung up in our one little space. And uh, if we can use that information and that technology for good, because there's always that yin and that yang or that balance, that there's, there's the bad that can come out of it or is there's the real positive. And the real positive is, is through that it created an environmental movement, it created a, a, a awareness for us to treat and integrate ourselves more in the biodiversity and, and change that cultural um, thing based on some, some tools that we have, it's sheer innovation. Um, and, and so I like that journey, but, but the, the, the other one is this connection from the birth of our earth, from whether it was the big bang to today, that we all started out as star stuff or microorganisms and we have more in common with other species and oak tree than we do with, with each other. We have more microorganisms, more microbial cells and more microbial genes in our body than we do human cells and human genes um, that make up our body. And so we, we truly, I'm not just saying it, Carl Sagan's not saying it, you're not saying it, we have more in common with the flora, the fauna, with other species, with our earth, and we truly know. And so that, that through that whole read, as I read, as you take us on this beautiful journey, you know, I'm thinking of that and I'm viewing it in this different light and, uh, uh, of, of what it is. And then, um, and, and so I see it in this different thing. And like I said, you, you start out with the earth rise and then at the end you, uh, I think around sub page 700 or so, you, you, you know, kind of ended up with the pale blue dot, which is also Carl Sagan. I, I, there, uh, there's some connections for me. I, I see things in complexities. Carl Sagan um, had a wife, his first wife. He's uh, Ann Durian is his wife when he passed away, and she's uh, runs the show Cosmos and is, is a wonderful producer. And, and, and but his first wife was Lynn Margulis, and she's one of the most famous. Uh, scientists made a, a movement around the world about a symbiotic earth. And so I think that's unique that that came from Carl Sagan, who also was the pinnacle to get us the blue dot image from that satellite that went up. Yeah. But I, I, I want to talk about now that in, in this journey, you talk, uh, uh, Lynn, Lynn Margulis only has a reference in your book just once, but Alfred Russell Wallace was one of the first British naturalists, an explorer, geographer, anthropologist, biologist, and il illustrator. He was best known for independently conceiving the theory of evolution through natural selection and has numerous papers. Uh, and some of them were published uh, 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 alongside or jointly with Charles uh, Darwin's writings in 1858. But the other one is that you mentioned quite a bit through, throughout the book is Charles Robert Darwin. Charles Darwin, as we know, the Darwin theory uh, was an English naturalist, biologist, uh, geologist. So you, you, you belong to these wonderful uh, evolutionary biologists who, for his science of evolution and the proposition that species of life have descended over time for common ancestors. And so now having just said all that big mouthful, uh, I'm trying to connect people to the earth, say that we're part of stardust, we're part of these microorganisms that made up the beginnings of life here on our planet. 
And then we're, we're talking about this evolutionary biologist that you mentioned in, in the book. And there's this journey that for me just continues to connect that, that we have more in common with our planet and these other species. And I, I, I'm moving to a question, I promise. And the, and the question is, is, um, is more of an explanation. Alfred Russell Wallace, you know, uh, this, this uh, evolution through natural selection. And I'm not sure how to understand it or how to properly dissect it. I have some, some of my own thoughts and opinions on that. And I would like you to, because eventually by the time Lynn Margulis comes, there's this natural selection survival of the fittest, fittest only the strong survive. Whereas Lynn Margulis says, we're more of a symbiotic earth. We have this symbiosis and we work in cooperation and collaboration instead of the strife. And so maybe you can tell us a little bit more about the book, but also in this journey of these, these great yeah. people. Yeah. Well, um, if, you, if you mentioned that uh, Lynn Margulis is, is only getting one citation um, and, and the fact that I mentioned Alfred Russell Wallace uh, a lot is that I wrote a, a biography on, on Alfred Russell Wallace. Okay. And there's half a meter of biographies out there in, 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 uh, uh, in, in uh, US and in, in uh, Great Britain, but uh, there was hardly, there's actually none, uh, there was none in, in Germany. So Alfred Russell Wallace was not known and this very exciting figure in 19th century natural history was not known and every, uh, everything was just related to Charles Darwin. And I'm a big fan of, of Charles Darwin, but there was a race, a silent race going on and um, many of the things that are um, written in about Darwin and about Wallace is definitely wrong. It's not covered by the historical facts. So he is an interesting figure. And he was actually one of the first, not only to, um, not completely independent, but um, uh, quite in isolation in, in Southeast Asia, uh, developed 14 years younger and 14 years after Charles Darwin, but publishing that in parallel to his to Darwin's development of his ideas, um, Charles Darwin and Alfred Russell Wallace they were they're both um, trying to um, develop this idea about natural selection, and Charles Darwin later also on sexual selection as the driving forces or the mechanisms of evolutionary change, and uh, they were sticking to um, to theory, to observable facts, and we still don't have anything better than their um, theory after 150 years, which is good for a theory, you know. Um, and um, I think what uh, the Gaia hypothesis of Thomas Lovejoy and and uh, you know this um, Jim Lovelock, yeah. Love, 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 yeah, sorry. Uh, and, and, you know, this idea of planet Earth being a super organism, that's, that's all fine, but it's not really put into a theory and natural, um, you know, in, 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 in strong um, terms of developing a, a natural sciences a theory. I think it is a, it's a nice um, narrative. It's very good to transport a lot of things, but we don't have scientific evidence of something that really is like an organism, you know. E.O. Wilson, another hero of my, um, you know, um, um, perspective yeah, yeah. on nature, E.O. Wilson, also considered ants, uh, you know, as and and the, the largest and, and super organisms and things like that. So we all have our ideas about how nature is is organized, but we don't have really a clear picture of um, that the planet Earth and, and nature on Earth is developed as a organisms. Um, it's it's. Um, um, it's, it's a picture, you know, it's a uh, metaphor, uh, it, all fine, but it's not really um, uh, like a verifiable theory. But it, it brings me to the point that uh, we do have specific perspectives and they are very long enduring. And one of the most enduring theories or perspective is the... Um, 
Uh, well, the the attitude of of uh, Homo sapiens of human beings to be outside nature, and I think um, putting a Earth perspective uh, into the uh, picture or trying to have this outside view on Earth as a super organisms or whatever helps to realize our um, position, our role in, in nature. And I prefer to view Homo sapiens as one species on Earth, one of the many species, a very um, a, a very special species, but still nothing um, different from the animal kingdom, you know? It's not us and them. It's not nature and culture, you know? Our uh, culture is our nature, you know? Um, our most interesting natural feature as Homo sapiens maybe is our ability for cultural evolution. So what I'm trying to say is that we have these, let's say, 2000 year long perception uh, going back to the Greek and Roman um, um, ancient times and the thinking, you know, um, that there are gods and half gods and human beings and things like that, you know, and then there is nature. Aristoteles was one of the first to, to make you know, scientific observation uh, on, on animals, but still his perception of human beings was that it's something completely different, you know? It's not, um, of course, as you said, and, and, and I think it's a very good um, way of realizing that, um, to, to call us being built of stardust is a very good picture to say, we are not outside universe, you know, we are part of it. Our very um, basic elements that uh, build us are related to uh, the Big Bang, you know. All these things help to put us in a better perspective. And I think one of those things, this is not a philosophical yeah. question. It is something that we have to realize in our day-to-day -day life, you know. People have lost um, the, the connection to nature, you know, in, in, a, in the future and, and within a, a couple of years or decades, we will have a, we have, we will have 70 to 80 percent of um, our world population um, living in big cities. You know, we have a degree of urbanization that detaches people from nature and, and we have lost contact you know some of the people today born and raised in cities they feel lost when it's getting dark without light when they don't have their smartphones with them you know and um, when there is some um, strange sound from an animal you know um, so we have completely detached from nature and no wonder that it is so difficult to uh, educate and teach people about their connectedness a connectedness to, to nature. And one of the other problems I would like to mention is what you, um, the point you raised when you mentioned complexity, you know. Um, of course, biodiversity issues are very complex. It's, it's like um, mythology and climate, you know. It's, it, these are complex systems. Um, they, all, they both have a long, um, far-reaching history. Um, they have a development, you know, they have many different um, facades and you need a lot of, you need an entire academy to, uh, to, to study, you know, so um, it is complex and it is outside our normal human being um, awareness of complexity. We are still adapted to what I call the, the mesocosmos, you know, there is this macro scale and the micro scale, you know, we, we don't understand if there are viruses and bacteria and um, light, you know, and, and, and all these physical um, things that we only understand um, if um, physicists uh, tell us about, you know. Um, this is the micro scale and the astrophysics uh, tell us about the macro scale. We are not adapted to that, you know, we don't have a 
natural appreciation of space and time you know it's, it's irritating when we learn what uh, albert einstein tried to to teach us you know and if you're not a mathematician it's very difficult to really get the core of it so we are adapted to the mesocosmos we're we're natural beings you know we're down to earth in a way um we're built um we have a primate um, evolutionary origin and and history so we are adapted to this fragment of possibilities on on earth you know like a um lag. i love i mean i love how you say this i don't want me to interrupt you but i want before you go on so we're we're, we're almost caught in between so there's the cosmos of our universe there's a metacosmos where we're kind of in and, but but then there's also the uh, the microcosmos, which also Lynn Margulis rises up. And but we're actually connected to all of those cosmos, but we're we really can only deal or see with that one, and we kind of need to make it work. And that's what I get out of your book. I see how yeah. how we're connected and how we can pull some of those things out. I love it. Well, there, there is one other uh, one other aspect, and and that is, a, I thought, is a um, you know an, an awareness that psychologists uh, developed, um, but it's not. It's going back to uh, to a, a fishery scientist, um, and uh, he developed uh, something that um, is the shifting baseline phenomenon. You know. Um, and, and, and it's basically saying that uh, when your grandfather is a fisherman, you know, he has he might have taken a thousand fishes with one haul, you know, and your and his son might have taken just a um, hundred, you know, and um, now his son um, is, is only taking 10. So with each generation, the, tra the threshold is is lower and we get uh, adapted to a lower threshold you know it's not a thousand it's a hundred it's ten so we are losing um because shifting baseline is moving over longer uh, time frames you know it's not a abrupt change it is a gradual change and we're adapting to that and we only grow up you know when when nature has changed and and the next generation is adapting and and um you know is is used to um the 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 new surrounding and then it's one good thing in homo sapiens that you always adapt to the new environment you know but at the same time you lose perspective of where populations for example come from you know how destructive um, earlier generations have been to to nature because of that shifting baseline um, phenomenon. Now, of course, we're losing we're losing contact to nature. We have this natural phenomenon of shifting baselines. Um, it is complex. We are not adapted to all that abstract complexity. We're adapted to the mesocosmos, you know. So um, and we still behave much like Homo sapiens uh, in the East African savanna. You know, we don't. We 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 might not like that. We might not accept it. But most of our human behavior is still triggered in a very original way by that. It helps us to survive, but it, it's also destructive in a way. So all these phenomena. Um, are related to what we uh, see right now when it comes to deformation and biodiversity uh, loss, you know, and that, that is the reason why I thought it was so important not to start by accumulating uh, one case study after the other, why we lose nature and why we are uh, losing tigers and all that, you know, and it's one of the problems in, in the uh, with, with nature conservation is that for decades you know all the big comp all the big um, uh, NGOs have focused um, on the flagship species uh, it, it, it might be the, the panda or the tiger or elephants or whatever and and especially the big cats and the mammals are only a fraction of biodiversity you know and neither have these uh, environmental and conservation efforts avoided that we lose the tigers, um, no, nor did we prevent um, big parts of nature to go um, 
um, downhill, you know. So I think focusing on tigers and helping tigers, as good as it is and as important as it is to rescue and to help to rescue each and every individual species, this is not the problem. The problem is that we are not having a proper perspective on nature due to our um, evolutionary heritage, due to our cultural education going back 2000 years to ancient times of, of the Greek and, and how we today live, you know, in big cities, um, raising without nature and, and people think if it is a green park, this is nature, you know. Um, most people won't believe that there's hardly any natural um, environment left uh, in, in, in entire um, uh, Europe. It might be different in Australia, it might be different in North America, but it's definitely hardly anything uh, that you call nature, uh, true nature that is left in, in, um, in Europe. So we have to focus on those areas in Africa and Asia, especially in, in, um, in South America, uh, where nature is, is still there and where there is the um, majority of, of biodiversity. And people don't believe, but actually we all depend very much on each and every single um, species, you know? And these are fragments of, of uh, the, the natural um, inheritance uh, and, and the richness. And, you know, losing the species and letting them go extinct is a bit like, you know, um, um, fiddling around with your uh, computer and deleting files, you know. You can do this file after file. You may only lose a picture from your last vacation, you know. But um, maybe you pick a very important uh, file that runs your computer, yeah? And we don't know. We don't know which species might be important for us. And just to give you one example, we are depending on two species of flies for um, pollination of um, the beans and the, the plants of, of um, uh, cacao, you know? Um, yeah. So um, we, we depend on all these pollinators. We have learned that there are millions and billions of US dollar worth of um, ecosystem services just by poly pollinators, you know? And it's not only, it's not only the uh, domesticated uh, honeybee, of course not, you know? These are will, um, um, other species of bees and other wild species. bees, yes, yeah, wild bees and 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 even beetles and and flies and ladybugs, butterflies, right. mosquitoes, flies. Yeah. There's a whole. So, so we depend on them just for these very uh, obvious uh, pollinator um, um, services, and of course we are, we depend on them for our water, for our nutrition, for an, a proper environment. And all that, you know, and, and that is, we are not living in a space rocket, you know. We, in a space rocket, you have to bring everything from Earth, you know, and try to survive when your shopping mall is closed, you know, and everything that you buy in your shopping mall actually comes from nature. So we have to get a, a broader awareness of all these factors that I tried um, to to uh, enumerate here, you know, our attitude towards nature, our perception of nature, our um, perspective on our own. And that's what I try to explain in, in the first chapters of the book. We, before we, we come to tigers and all the elephants and all these animals that are that are going and uh, and and um, of course there is a mess message at the end what we can do and how we can hope to rescue tigers and elephants and all the other animals on earth but but um, we can only do if we learn much faster and be more you know aware of all these phenomena i i totally agree and i it's so it's so true that we not not only is it a complexity thing that's hard for us to to see that because of where we're at as, uh, as in our evolutionary state, but also where we're at in life, it's just hard to see this bigger picture um, because you, you, we get focused in on the orangutans and the elephants and, and those species, but there's a lot 
smaller and other species that, and, and even further, it wasn't until two, 2015 that we discovered a whole nother branch of the, the bacteria tree of life, which is all bacteria that lives in our bodies and our gut, you know, gut health, the micro uh, 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 organisms of, uh, that provide us with gut health, good, uh, good digestive health. And, and uh, they're saying that could be the second brain, but how closely that uh, biome is tied to the earth biome, our soil health, there's a whole nother in every aspect on this entire planet where we could reach into the dirt and have indigenous microorganisms in our soil that are unseen to the naked eye that, that we don't even know are there that are also uh, going extinct because we just, we don't, we don't have this microscopic lens that we're carrying around. So it's much more complex, but I believe that the, the thing that I get through your entire book is that if we can connect ourselves with this knowledge that we're part of this uh, symbiotic earth, that we're part of, of this destruction and what, what is actually happening, then we can also be the ones to avert it, to do something about it and, and to take that action. And right. once we hit a, a critical mass and, and that uh, cultivated cultural evolution shift, uh, uh, I think we can hit that exponential curve. We can get enough mass, get enough people to, to yeah, it's still slow, but we can have a, a cultural evolution that's uh, probably going to be right in, in, in the line of where we need to go. It's about education. It's about disseminating. It's about giving people the bigger history, the bigger picture. And that's yeah. really so much why, why I love your book and why I wanted to to dissect it a little bit more and, and to speak about it and how, you know, have your wonderful words tell us more about it. I don't know if you want to, um, we're running a little short on time, so I don't want to take it too long, um, but I, I would like to maybe have you give us a little bit more wrap up on what you would like us to know about the book. And then I, I want to go in uh, to some final questions for my guests and also want to talk about a little bit about the museums and the fabulous things that you're doing with the yeah. museums. Yeah. Well, um, th th there is one. There is one important aspect. Oh, um, of course, um, many of those um, problems we were talking about are uh, not, uh, you know, inventions of our um, um, time. You know, we have problems of destruction of nature and loss of species. Um, like uh, since many years, you know, um, we have lost about five hundred species of vertebrates over the last 500 years. It doesn't look very much. Uh, our effect is not very large. But actually, this is a, um, this is a misguiding perspective. Um, but you can, at the same time, for our generation, you can develop some hope. And, and that is, of course, we are the generation. Um, or, you know, I'm, I'm born in the early 60, 1960s, you know. And um, it, it is since uh, half a century that we have this destructive, this most destructive um, development uh, uh, influence on, on Earth. But at the same time, it is that no generation before us had all this accumulated knowledge about um, our evolution. If you think what we know, what we knew um, 50 years ago on evolution, um, about human evolution, about all these fancy uh, fossils that have been found since then, you know, Lucy and Neanderthals and, and, and all these fascinating discoveries, um, the, the um, discoveries of not only the te technology that we have developed, but also the awareness um, of uh, DNA and, and how, what you can do with DNA. And, and the Nobel Prize these years um, went to um, two women who developed a instrument, how you can manipulate um, uh, DNA discovered only 50 years ago. So what I'm saying is we are most destructive generation uh, ever. Um, but at the same time, we are the, the generation that is also um, most influential in terms of having the knowledge and having the instruments in terms of everyone has a smartphone and, and, and all that. So it, there is hope that using this 
technology, using the awareness and the knowledge that we have about our nature, about our relation to nature. And, and uh, I hope this is something that the book transports, that um, we, we came a long way, we have learned a lot, we know a lot, and it's very frustrating to uh, learn about all these facts. But at the same time, you have to take that as there is a good news behind it. And that is, there is a way of um, taking steps, um, what, what we can do. And, and, and one thing that we can do is uh, looking at what is the most destructive effect of, of human beings. And that is certainly our way of how we produce uh, our food. It is agriculture. It is that we are destroying rainforests and, and um, the natural vegetation, and that we are not allowing animals to move around, that we don't have enough um, um, conservation uh, areas, that we don't have enough natural parks and, and, and all that. Um, it, on, a, on a world scale over the last couple of years, we have um, increased the amount of protected areas. Um, and, and partly, of course, admittedly, those are paper parts. Um, but on a, on a, in average, that is only covering 15% of Earth in, on, in the terrestrial uh, realm, and then it's only 7% uh, in the ocean. Th this is much too less. It's not enough to protect nature and to um, save biodiversity. So the awareness of scientists over the last couple of years is that we should focus not only on individual species to try to prevent the tigers go extinct. Of course we will, but we have to focus um, political action. And you can measure those actions and the effect of those um, measures by um, looking at how much area actually is left for nature. And we have to increase that by, um, we have to double that. And there is this um, suggestion of E.O. Wilson, half Earth, that by um, half, or by, by the middle of this um, uh, century, 2050, we should try at least, we should try hard to protect 50% of Earth. We should re- um, um, develop and uh, natural areas, you know, we have, we need to have a better, better um, treatment of those areas where we uh, want to grow our uh, crops and, and, and everything. So we have to rise the 15% that are protected now to another 35 and add another 35 um, uh, percent. And there is, um, there, there are websites on this a global safety net activities. You can, you know, download that. You can uh, on site. You can actually look into your uh, neighborhood where are protected areas. We try. We need to build corridors to connect them. So the message uh, behind all that is there is hope. There is some activity um, that we can actually do. Um, 2030, after uh, the next decade. There is a chance that we have substantially improved situation of nature. We have allocated those areas where nature uh, should um, have a better protection, and we should avoid to, um, you know, to to um, destroy more nature for non um, sustainable uh, processes. You know, we should not allow to destroy more nature. We should be more aware of the last remnants and fragments of natural environments that we have. And, and that is the message. We need to do something. And if we don't, um, it is not only about some species going extant, tough, um, it is about us. It is a danger that will be um, will become more and more influential in uh, our day-to-day -day activities. Um, not only for our generation, it'll be influential and and very destructive for the next generation, my children and their children. So um, we need to do something. This is what I'm convinced of. We need to do something. We need to learn about that, and we need to take action in the next years, in the next decade. There's not a century that is left. 
and uh, we should better hurry. So that is basically, uh, hopefully, um, a message I, that you I can- I totally use. agree. We absolutely need to start acting and, and uh, the science is there, the, the research, the papers, the, the guidance, the, <laughs> the plans that they're there. We just really need to start acting. And I, I, I love your wisdoms. I, I have faith in humanity that we will make the curve and uh, cultivate a, a new culture, cultural evolution that, that gets us there uh, quicker. You, you uh, speak volumes to my heart. My, my next book is coming out at the end of this year. It's called Menu B, People and Planet Food Saving Solutions. So I also speak a lot about how food pays and how we grow food and how we produce food and how we package food and transport it has the biggest effect to not only biodiversity, but to, to draw down, to get us in what, and, and, and really what the gist is of what you're saying is we need to learn to live within the safe operating spaces of our planetary boundaries. Yeah. Professor yeah. Johan Rockstrom, Stockholm Resilience Center Institute, yeah. and really figure out how we can do it. We just need to, we need to understand how to do it and, and apply some of the things you said. I really, really appreciate you giving us the, it's hard to make it concise in a short amount of time about the book. I want my listeners to know, this is now in the fourth print run, this end of the evolution. Now this is in German. So if you don't read German, you're a little bit out of luck, but that brings my, my last question about the book. Do you think we'll ever see something in English or it's just not the right market? There's other books available in English or? Well, um, it, it is it is a bit of a one way uh, um, traffic here. Um, we 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 do see a lot of translations from uh, the U.S. market, from uh, Great Britain, from Australia, all the uh, Anglo American or Anglophone uh, communities. So we are basically rich because um, we got all your books uh, translated uh, sooner or later. If you can't read it in English, and, and there's a lot of books, of course, in, in German, it's not the same uh, vice versa. It's, it's not that many of the German books are translated because, of course, people think, uh, first of all, this is a big volume. And second, uh, people think, OK, there's a lot of books out there. Um, although I'm, 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 I'm sure it's, it's not only written for a um, European or German um, audience, but uh, as I said, it's, it's, uh, it's a bit of a um, um, difficult um, I business. hope one of my listeners contacts you and says, I want to help translate <laughs> yeah. it and get it, get it into English or, or a, a yeah. new publisher awesome. contacts you to say that because- I would appreciate it, that. It, it, it would make a great read in English and it's definitely a needed book. And, and I, I read a lot of books like that and there's very few in English that I feel that are such a nice compendium or compilation of, of what you presented. So I really thank you about that. So thank you. Well, we've touched enough on, on the book, but now, now I wanna really get into some some other amazing things, if you can give us a little insight on the wonderful things you're doing with the museums. And it's not just one, it's a yeah. couple. And, and also we both live in Hamburg, we're both in Hamburg. So uh, if you could tell me a little bit what, what you uh, are doing there and give us some insight on that because it's highly yeah. interesting. Okay, well, thanks uh, for, for giving the uh, a, a typical museum man the opportunity to explain that Natural history museums are far away from being the most boring, dusty places. And that is the image that many natural history museums or um, these historical collections had for a long time. Um, uh, I was, of course, raised and educated and studied in, in Hamburg. But then I served as curator as, and, and as director for research in the reorganized um, Berlin Natural History Museum for 20 years. So um, that's basically where I, I learned the business um, that there is this research department. And of course, you have these huge uh, collections. You know, in Berlin, it's, we talk about 30 million um, specimen, you know, just to put that into perspective, the world largest natural history museum is in London. We talk about nearly 70 million specimens. So Berlin is only half of that. And Hamburg has a collection that is about 10 million specimens. 
But the problem in Hamburg was it was at that time the second largest, second only to Berlin, when it was destroyed in uh, late July 1943 uh, by the so-called Operation Gomorra that destroyed parts of large part of the inner city of Hamburg. And the museum was destroyed, but um, fortunate enough, the um, some clever curators, you know, although it was not uh, very um, uh, seen uh, um, at that time, uh, some clever curators organized to transport um, the collection into outside depots, and that way it, uh, the, the historical collection was rescued. It's a large um, 10 million specimen collection, historical collection, and um, then it was uh, it had an odyssey through Hamburg, you know. And, and over the last 70 years after the Second World War, people in Hamburg uh, completely forgot um, about this collection. You know, it was put, uh, it was given to the university. A university at that time in the 60s and 70s were growing to mass universities in Germany, and many of the scientists were then used or misused um, as uh, uh, um, university teachers and neglecting their curatorial duties in the collection. So uh, that, that went downhill in Hamburg and people forgot about it and there was no activities, although it was one of the largest natural history collections in, um, in, in, in Germany, in, in Europe. And, and by the way, which is typical for a city like Hamburg, close to the sea, uh, we do have in Hamburg at the Zoological Museum, the largest in Germany, the largest um, collection for fishes, larger than um, Berlin or, or Frankfurt, you know, and, and we do have a, a couple of other uh, groups like um, polychaetes, these, these are worms from, from the sea, from the oceans, and some other groups that are, um, you know, world renowned and larger because of curators having collected and, and worked here and, and did their scientific work. So um, we do have a rich um, but long neglected um, zoological collection. And when I started here, I was, you know, um, I, I was uh, offered a position as professor for biodiversity of animals in 2014. And when I started, I developed a concept um, in Germany, it is called Evolutionium. It basically translates maybe not very nicely into English like Evolutionum, uh, which is the combination of um, evolution and museum. And what we want to do is we want to rebuild the Natural History Museum in Hamburg. Um, and that is only possible if you get, if you raise funding. And it's not only about raising funding for like 120, 130 million euro for the building, for the new museum. It's basically that we need to um, prove that we are a reasonable research institution, um, much more than reasonable. We need to be um, excellent. Um, and then what we have proven, there was an evaluation by uh, some councils in Germany. And now we are developing this collection into a research institute. We call that the Leibniz Institute for the analysis of biodiversity dynamics. So related to what we just talked about in the book, um, it's a research subject where we don't want to concentrate on the discovery of biodiversity, which is important too, but we want to focus on the change of biodiversity, not only in evolutionary times, but also in anthropogenetic times, which is wow. basically in the last 100 years, or maybe the last 200 years, or maybe the last 10 or 20 years. So um, this is our research agenda, and um, it is financed now by a combination of federal state money and local money. And uh, so we hope to pay the bills for our scientists. And at the same time now, we have gotten the interest of the politicians here in Hamburg. And we are right now looking for a central um, location for building this evolutionum uh, as a new innovative museum. And what we want to do is we want to make human beings focus of the Natural History Museum. We don't want to just, you know, display 
um, you know, taxidermy of, of um, polar bears, you know, of course we can do that. We don't want to show just dinosaurs, which we also can do and we will, but we want to focus on um, the role of human beings as a evolutionary factor, not only transforming the geosphere, but also influencing, largely influencing the biosphere. So all the subjects we were just talking about um, in connection with my book um, should become focused on the exhibit of this research um, museum. And in Germany, we call those an integrative research museum, which has two, oh, sorry, we, which have three pillars. Uh, it's basically research, it's collection, and it's exhibition. So everything that today is the uh, transfer of knowledge. So we, we, are, we are thinking or we are developing um, a concept um, extending from just exhi um, uh, exhibitions uh, to raise interest in a wider audience for these subjects that we just um, talked about. Yeah. I love it. Boy, that is so beautiful. Thank you for sharing that insight. And um, I, I, I hope some of our listeners and somebody just comes out and you get the funding, you find the place and we support it. <laughs> And it, uh, once it's there, I'm definitely excited. I need to get uh, in, in touch with you once we get out of this next lockdown to come and get my book signed anyway. <laughs> Wanted to do that a couple of times now and, and haven't been able to. I have three last takeaways for my listeners yeah. before we say goodbye. I want to give them a sustainable takeaway, something that they can use or apply in their life. And um it's kind, of, it's kind of a selfish thing because you've given us a lot of wisdom already, but I, I want them to, you know, uh, you to depart something to them as well. And so if there was one message that you could depart to my listeners, that is a sustainable takeaway that has the power to change their life. What would it be basically your message? Well, um, I think, uh, independent of uh, what you're doing, uh, where you're living, um, my message would be to think more consciously about your connection to nature. Um, like if you live in the city, um, think about what kind of nature um, you have in your surrounding that you use. And some people might feel that this is a poor life in terms of connection to nature. And maybe their only connection is that um, for three weeks in the summer, they go somewhere where there is um, a you know, beach around them. Um, but you can start maybe in your garden. So if you're lucky enough to have a green spot around where you live, uh, think about how you treat this. Maybe there's more stone than trees and things like that. So um, my message is think how you are connected to nature. Um, how, get, how do you get your, your um, food? What are you eating? Are you eating beef? Are you eating uh, meat? Um, what kind? How often? Because that is all related to rainforest. We all know about that. Um, it's related to how we grow uh, food. And I think it is not waiting for politicians to change um, the rules. It is about us being aware that we should help to change the rules. And that is part of um, how often we use uh, planes in the future, uh, what we eat, where we go, uh, how we treat nature in our gardens, uh, how we um, eliminate nature for another area where we want to build housing or a autobahn or whatever is built. And we should be much more conscious. And I'm not saying we should, and we will be able to avoid everything. I'm not saying here in, in an ascetic um, mission um, that we should go back to nature. No way. Um, it is about uh, being more conscious about that. Thank you very much. What should young biologists or evolutionary biologists or innovators looking to get in the museum industry in your field or what your career has done over all these years, even an author, be thinking about if they are looking for ways to make a real 
impact? Um, I would try to convince them that the reductionistic approach to nature and to sequence everything, to squeeze it into an Eppendorf tube and to look through a, through a microscope and to use fancy new techniques will not teach us anything about organisms and the function of organisms. And they should not make the mistake that those areas that are most successful by nature and science and impacts and getting most funding right now is the best of all perspective on nature. So we are very single-minded and um, education, even in biology departments, these days is very single-minded, very narrow-minded, and uh, we should try and teach them to say, uh, free yourself from this restrictive perspective on your own discipline. It's misguiding and it's not really helping us in any way, no matter how successful you are. Thank you. And then what have you experienced or learned in your professional journey so far that you would have loved to know from the start? Um, I, was, I was very much neglecting um, the um, humanities. I was very much neglecting history of science, theory of, uh, of science. I was very much focused on the particulars of my own discipline. I'm, I, uh, I was focused on the specific group I'm doing research on. I was focused on um, evolution as a scientific discipline, and I was missing the overall picture, uh, the theory behind it, uh, the history um, behind it. So um, I, th I think it would have been much easier to get to know all these uh, relation between the disciplines and um, the history and the theory much earlier in my career. And, and that should have accompanied me way earlier and not, um, I learned it very late in my career. And uh, I would hope that it will be better for the next generation to have this much more advanced a picture earlier in their career, not to be educated and just focusing narrow-mindedly. So, um, yeah, tough if you learn, if you if it takes so long to learn about all that. Well, I'm going to definitely put all your links into the show notes and descriptions so people can go out there and look at the book, look at your slides, look at things that you've posted online, things about the museum so that they can follow you. Um, uh, I, I believe you've given us the best words of wisdom ever. So I really appreciate your time and um, for talking to us, giving us the in-depth about the book. I really thank you for your time so much, Matthias. And I wish you and your family a wonderful rest of the evening. And I, I hope we see each other very, very soon. Thank you. Mark, thank you very much. Uh, it was a pleasure and, and, and thanks for uh, being able to, to talk to you and your um, to listeners and audience. Thank you. Thank you.